Question of Price Part 2 Apart from the curt, ceremonious greetings with which she welcomed him as Lord de Forhorn, Queen Calanthe didn't exchange a single word with the witcher. The banquet was about to begin, and the guests, loudly announced by the herald, were gathering. The table was huge, rectangular, and could seat more than forty men. Calanthe sat at the head of the table on a throne with a high backrest. Geralt sat on her right, and on her left, a grey-haired bard called Drogodar with a lute. Two more chairs at the head of the table on the Queen's left remained empty. To Geralt's right, along the table, sat Haxo and a voyevode whose name he'd forgotten. Beyond them were guests from the Duchy of Atre, the sullen and silent Knight Rainfarn, and his charge, the chubby twelve-year-old Prince Vindhelm, one of the pretenders to the princess's hand. Further down were the colourful and motley knights from Sintra and local vassals. Baron Elambert of Teg, announced the herald. Kukutak, murmured Calanthe, nudging Drogadar. This will be fun. A thin and whiskered, richly attired knight bowed low, but his lively, happy eyes and cheerful smirk belied his subservience. Greetings, Kukutak, said the queen ceremoniously. Obviously the baron was better known by his nickname than by his family name. We are happy to see you. And I am happy to be invited, declared Kukudak, and sighed. Oh, well, I'll cast an eye on the princess, if you permit, my queen. It's hard to live alone, ma'am. Aye, Kukudak. Kalanthe smiled faintly, wrapping a lock of hair around her finger. But you're already married, as we well know. Ah. The baron was miffed. You know yourself, ma'am, how weak and delicate my wife is, and smallpox is rife in the neighbourhood. I bet my belt and sword against a pair of old slippers that in a year I've already be out of mourning. Poor man, Kukudak, but lucky, too. Calanthe's smile grew wider. Lucky your wife isn't stronger. I hear that last harvest, when she caught you in the haystack with a strumpet, she chased you for almost a mile with a pitchfork, but couldn't catch you. You have to feed her better, cuddle her more, and take care that her back doesn't get cold during the night. Then, in a year, you'll see how much better she is. Kukudak pretended to grow doleful. I take your point, but can I stay for the feast? We'd be delighted, Baron. The legation from Skellig, shouted the herald, becoming increasingly hoarse. The islanders... Four of them, in shiny leather doublets trimmed with seal fur and belted with checkered woolen sashes, strode in with a sprightly, hollow step. They were led by a sinewy warrior with a dark face and aquiline nose, and at his side a broad-shouldered youth with a mop of red hair. They all bowed before the queen. "'It is a great honour, said Calanthe, a little flushed, "'to welcome such an excellent knight as East Tjursach of Skellige to my castle again.' If it weren't for your well-known disdain for marriage, I'd be delighted to think you're here to court my pavetta. Has loneliness got the better of you after all, sir? Often enough, beautiful Calanthe, replied the dark-faced islander, raising his glistening eyes to the queen. But my life is too dangerous for me to contemplate a lasting union. If it weren't for that, pavetta is still a young girl, an unopened bud, but I can see. See what? The apple does not fall far from the tree, smiled East Tirsa, flashing his white teeth. Suffice it to look at you, my queen, to know how beautiful the princess will be when she reaches the age at which a woman can please a warrior. In the meantime, it is young men who are to court her, such as our King Bran's nephew here, Krach and Crete, who travelled here for exactly that purpose. Krach, bowing his red head, knelt on one knee before the queen. Who else have you brought to East? A thick-set, robust man with a bushy beard and a strapping fellow with bagpipes on his back knelt by Krach and Crete. This is the gallant druid Mousesack, who, like me, is a good friend and adviser to King Bran. And this is Drig Bondu, our famous scald. And thirty seamen from Skelliger are waiting in the courtyard, burning with hope to catch a glimpse of the beautiful Calanthe of Sintra. Sit down, noble guests. Uh, Tjursag, sir, sit here. 
East took the vacant seat at the narrower end of the table, only separated from the Queen by Drogadar and an empty chair. The remaining islanders sat together on the left, between Marshal Visigerd and the three sons of Lord Strept, Tinglant, Fodkat, and Vildhill. That's more or less, everyone. The Queen leant over to the Marshal. Let's begin, Visigerd. The Marshal clapped his hands. The servants, carrying platters and jugs, moved towards the table in a long line, greeted by a joyful murmur from the guests. Calanthe barely ate, reluctantly picking at the morsels served her with a silver fork. Drogadar, having bolted his food, kept strumming his lute. The rest of the guests, on the other hand, laid waste to the roast piglets, birds, fish and mollusks on offer, with the red-haired Krach and Krait in the lead. Ringfarn of Atre reprimanded the young Prince Vindhalm severely, even slapping his hand when he reached for a jug of cider. Kukudak stopped picking bones for a moment and entertained his neighbours by imitating the whistle of a mud turtle. The atmosphere grew merrier by the minute. The first toasts were being raised and already becoming less and less coherent. Calanthe adjusted the narrow golden circlet on her curled ash-grey hair and turned to Geralt, who was busy cracking open a huge red lobster. It's loud enough that we can exchange a few words discreetly. Let us start with courtesies. I'm pleased to meet you. The pleasure is mutual, Your Majesty. After the courtesies come hard facts. I've got a job for you. So I gathered. I'm really invited to feasts for the pleasure of my company. You're probably not very interesting company, then. What else have you gathered? I'll tell you when you've outlined my task, Your Majesty. Get out, said Calanthe, her fingers tapping an emerald necklace, the smallest stone of which was the size of a bumblebee. What sort of task do you expect as a witcher? What, digging a well? Repairing a hole in the roof? Weaving a tapestry of all the positions King Vridank and the beautiful Cero tried on their wedding night? Surely you know what your profession's about. Yes, I do. I'll tell you what I've gathered, Your Majesty. I'm curious. I gathered that. And that, like many others, you've mistaken my trade for an altogether different profession. Oh? Calanthe, casually leaning towards the lute-strumming Drogadar, gave the impression of being pensive and absent. Who, Geralt, makes up this ignorant horde with whom you acquit me? And for what profession do those fools mistake your trade? Your Majesty, said Geralt calmly, while I was riding to Sintra, I met villagers, merchants, peddlers, dwarves, tinkers and woodcutters. They told me about a black anise who has its hideout somewhere in these woods a little house on a chicken claw tripod. They mentioned the chimera nestling in the mountains, Aeshners and centipede animals. Apparently, a manticore could also be found if you look hard enough. So many tasks a witcher could perform without having to dress up in someone else's feathers and coat of arms. You didn't answer my question. Your Majesty, I don't doubt that a marriage alliance with Skaliga is necessary for Sintra. It's possible, too, that the schemers who want to prevent it deserve a lesson using means which don't involve you. It's convenient if this lesson were to be given by an unknown lord from Forhorn, who would then disappear from the scene. And now I'll answer your question. You mistake my trade for that of a hired killer. Those others, of whom there are so many, are rulers. It's not the first time I've been called to a court where the problems demand the quick solutions of a sword. But I've never killed people for money, regardless of whether it's for a good or bad cause and I never will. The atmosphere at the table was growing more and more lively as the beer diminished. The red-haired Krach and Krait found appreciative listeners to his tale of the battle at Thwith. Having sketched a map on the table with the help of meat bones dipped in sauce, he marked out the strategic plan, shouting loudly. Kukudak, proving how apt his nickname was, suddenly cackled like a very real sitting hen, creating general mirth among the guests, and consternation among the servants, who were convinced that a bird, mocking their vigilance, had somehow managed to make its way from the courtyard into the hall. Thus fate has punished me with too shrewd a witcher. Calanthe smiled, but her eyes were narrowed and angry. A witcher, who without a shadow of respect, or at the very least of common courtesy, exposes my intrigues and infamous plans, but hasn't fascination with my beauty and charming personality clouded your judgment? Don't ever do that again, Geralt. 
Don't speak to those in power like that. Few of them would forget your words, and you know kings. They have all sorts of things at their disposal. Daggers, poisons, dungeons, red-hot pokers. There are hundreds, thousands of ways kings can avenge their wounded pride. And you wouldn't believe how easy it is, Geralt, to wound some ruler's pride. Really, will any of them take words such as no, I won't, and never, calmly? But that's nothing. Interrupt one of them, or make inappropriate comments, and you'll condemn yourself to the wheel. The Queen clasped her narrow white hands together, and lightly rested her chin on them. Geralt didn't interrupt, nor did he comment. Kings, continued Calanthe, divide people into two categories, those they order around, and those they buy, because they adhere to the old and banal truth that everyone can be bought. Everyone. It's only a question of price. Don't you agree? Ah, I don't need to ask. You're a witcher, after all. You do your job and take the money. As far as you're concerned, the idea of being bought has lost its scornful undertone. The question of your price, too, is clear, related as it is to the difficulty of the task and how well you execute it. And your fame, Geralt. Old men at fairs and markets sing of the exploits of the white-haired witcher from Rivia. If even half of it is true, then I wager your services are not cheap. So, it would be a waste of money to engage you in such simple, trite matters as palace intrigue or murder. Those can be dealt with by other, cheaper hands. <coughs> roared Kukudak suddenly, to loud applause. Geralt didn't know which animal he was imitating, but he didn't want to meet anything like it. He turned his head and caught the queen's venomously green glance. Drogadar, his lowered head and face concealed by his curtain of grey hair, quietly strummed his lute. Ah, Geralt, said Calanthe, with a gesture forbidding a servant from refilling her goblet. I speak, and you remain silent. We're at a feast. We all want to enjoy ourselves. Amuse me. I'm starting to miss your pertinent remarks and perceptive comments. I'd also be pleased to hear a compliment or two, homage, or assurance of your obedience, in whichever order you choose. Oh, well, Your Majesty, said the Witcher, I'm not a very interesting dinner companion. I'm amazed to be singled out for the honour of occupying this place. Indeed, someone far more appropriate should have been seated here. Anyone you wished. It would have sufficed for you to give them the order, or to buy them. It's only a question of price. Go on, go on. Calanthe tilted her head back and closed her eyes, the semblance of a pleasant smile on her lips. So, I'm honoured and proud to be sitting by Queen Calanthe of Sintra, whose beauty is surpassed only by her wisdom. I also regard it as a great honour that the Queen has heard of me, and that, on the basis of what she has heard, does not wish to use me for trivial matters. Last winter, Prince Hroberic, not being so gracious, tried to hire me to find a beauty who, sick of his vulgar advances, had fled the ball, losing a slipper. It was difficult to convince him that he needed a huntsman, and not a witcher. The queen was listening with an enigmatic smile. Other rulers, too, unequal to you in wisdom, didn't refrain from proposing trivial tasks. It was usually a question of the murder of a stepson, stepfather, stepmother, uncle, aunt. It's hard to mention them all. They were all of the opinion that it was simply a question of price. The Queen's smile could have meant anything. And so, I repeat, Geralt bowed his head a little, that I can't contain my pride to be sitting next to you, ma'am. And pride means a very great deal to us witches. You wouldn't believe how much. A lord once offended a witch's pride by proposing a job that wasn't in keeping with either honour or the witch's code. What's more, he didn't accept a polite refusal and wished to prevent the witcher from leaving his castle. Afterwards, everyone agreed this wasn't one of his best ideas. Get out, said Calanthe, after a moment's pause. You were wrong. You're a very interesting dinner companion. Kukudak, shaking beer froth from his whiskers and the front of his jacket, craned his neck 
and gave the penetrating howl of a she-wolf in heat. The dogs in the courtyard and the entire neighbourhood echoed the howl. One of the brothers from Strept dipped his finger in his beer and touched up the thick line around the formation drawn by Krach and Krit. Error and incompetence, he shouted. They shouldn't have done that. Here, towards the wing, that's where they should have directed the cavalry, struck the flanks. Ha! roared Krach and Krit, whacking the table with a bone and splattering his neighbours' faces and tunics with sauce. And so weak in the centre! A key possession! Ludicrous! Only someone who's blind or sick in the head would miss the opportunity to manoeuvre in a situation like that. That's it! Quite right! shouted Vindhelm of Atri. He's asking you, you little snot! Snot yourself! Shut your gob or I'll wallop you! Sit on your ears and keep quiet, Krach! called East Tirsich, interrupting his conversation with Visigerd. Enough of these arguments! Drogadar, sir, don't waste your talent. Indeed, your beautiful though quiet tunes should be listened to with greater concentration and gravity. Drake Bondu, stop scoffing and guzzling. You're not going to impress anyone here like that. Pump up your bagpipes and delight our ears with decent martial music. Uh, with your permission, noble Calanthe. Oh, mother of mine, whispered the queen to Geralt, raising her eyes to the vault for a moment in silent resignation. But she nodded her permission, smiling openly and kindly. Drig Pontu, said East, play us the song of the Battle of Hochebuts. It won't leave us in any doubt as to the tactical manoeuvres of commanders, or as to who acquired immortal theme there, to the health of the heroic Calanthe of Sintra. The health and glory, the guests roared, emptying their goblets and clay cups. Drake Bondu's bagpipes gave out an ominous drone and burst into a terrible, drawn-out, modulated wail. The guests took up the song, beating out a rhythm on the table with whatever came to hand. Kukudak was staring avidly at the goat-leather sack, captivated by the idea of adopting its dreadful tones in his own repertoire. Hochibuts, said Calanthe, looking at Geralt. My first battle. Although I fear rousing the indignation and contempt of such a proud witcher, I confess that we were fighting for money. Our enemy was burning villages, which paid us levies, and we, greedy for our tributes, challenged them on the field. A trivial reason, a trivial battle, a trivial three thousand corpses picked to pieces by the crows. And look, instead of being ashamed, I'm proud as a peacock that songs are sung about me even when sung to such awful music. Again she summoned her parody of a smile full of happiness and kindness, and answered the toast raised to her by lifting her own empty goblet. Geralt remained silent. Let's go on. Calanthe accepted a pheasant leg offered to her by Drogadar, and picked at it gracefully. As I said, you've aroused my interest. I've been told that witches are an interesting caste, but I didn't really believe it. Now I do. When hit, you give a note which shows you're fashioned of pure steel, unlike these men moulded from birdshit, which doesn't in any way change the fact that you're here to execute a task, and you'll do it without being so clever. Geralt didn't smile disrespectfully or nastily, although he very much wanted to. He held his silence. I thought, murmured the Queen, appearing to give her full attention to the pheasant's thigh, that you'd say something, or smile. No? All the better. Can I consider our negotiations concluded? Unclear tasks, said the witcher dryly, can't be clearly executed. What's unclear? You did, after all, guess correctly. I have plans regarding a marriage alliance with Skaliga. These plans are threatened, and I need you to eliminate the threat. But here your shrewdness ends. The supposition that I mistake your trade for that of a hired thug has piqued me greatly. Accept, Geralt, that I belong to that select group of rulers who know exactly what witches do, and how they ought to be employed. On the other hand, if someone kills as efficiently as you do, even though not for money, he shouldn't be surprised if people credit him with being a professional in that field. Your fame runs ahead of you, Geralt. 
It's louder than Drake Bondu's accursed bagpipes, and there are equally few pleasant notes in it. The bagpipe player, although he couldn't hear the Queen's words, finished his concert. The guests rewarded him with an uproarious ovation, and dedicated themselves with renewed zeal to the remains of the banquet, recalling battles and making rude jokes about womenfolk. Kukudak was making a series of loud noises, but there was no way to tell if these were yet another animal imitation, or an attempt to relieve his overloaded stomach. East Tirsach leant far across the table. Your Majesty, he said, there are good reasons, I am sure, for your dedication to the Lord from Forhorn. But it's high time we saw our Princess Pavetta. What are we waiting for? Surely not for Krach and Crete to get drunk, and even that moment is almost here. You're right, as usual, East. Calanthe smiled warmly. Geralt was amazed by her arsenal of smiles. Indeed, I do have important matters to discuss with the Honourable Ravix. I'll dedicate some time to you, too. But you know my principle. Duty, then pleasure. Haxo! She raised her hand and beckoned the castellan. Haxo rose without a word, bowed, and quickly ran upstairs, disappearing into the dark gallery. The queen turned to the witcher. You heard? We've been debating for too long. If Pavetta has stopped preening in front of the looking-glass, she'll be here presently. So prick up your ears, because I won't repeat this. I want to achieve the ends which, to a certain degree, you have guessed. There can be no other solution. As for you, you have a choice. You can be forced to act by my command. I don't wish to dwell on the consequences of disobedience, although obedience will be generously rewarded. Or you can render me a paid service. Note that I didn't say, I can buy you, because I've decided not to offend your witch's pride. There's a huge difference, isn't there? The magnitude of this difference has somehow escaped my notice. Then pay greater attention. The difference, my dear witcher, is that one who is bought is paid according to the buyer's whim, whereas one who renders a service sets his own price. Is that clear? To a certain extent. Let's say, then, that I choose to serve. Surely I should know what that entails. No. Only a command has to be specific and explicit. A paid service is different. I'm interested in the results, nothing more. How you achieve it is your business. Geralt, raising his head, met Mausak's penetrating black gaze. The druid of Skellige, without taking his eyes from the witcher, was crumbling bread in his hands and dropping it as if lost in thought. Geralt looked down. There, on the oak table, crumbs, grains of buckwheat and fragments of lobster shell were moving like ants. They were forming runes which joined up, for a moment, into a word. A question. Mausak waited without taking his eyes off him. Geralt, almost imperceptibly, nodded. The druid lowered his eyelids and, with a stony face, swiped the crumbs off the table. Honourable gentlemen, called the herald, Pavetar of Sintra. The guests grew silent, turning to the stairs. Preceded by the castellan and a fair-haired page in a scarlet doublet, the princess descended slowly, her head lowered. The colour of her hair was identical to her mother's, ash grey, but she wore it braided into two thick plaits which reached below her waist. Pavetta was adorned only with a tiara ornamented with a delicately worked jewel and a belt of tiny golden links which girded her long silvery blue dress at the hips. Escorted by the page, Herald, Castellan and Visegerd, the princess occupied the empty chair between Drogadar and East Tirsach. The knightly islander immediately filled her goblet and entertained her with conversation. Geralt didn't notice her answer with more than a word. Her eyes were permanently lowered, hidden behind her long lashes, even during the noisy toasts raised to her around the table. There was no doubt her beauty had impressed the guests. Krach and Krit stopped shouting and stared at Pavetta in silence, even forgetting his tankard of beer. Vindhalm of Atri was also devouring the princess with his eyes. 
flushing shades of red as though only a few grains in the hourglass separated them from their wedding night. Kukudak and the brothers from Strept were studying the girl's petite face too, with suspicious concentration. Aha, said Calanthe quietly, clearly pleased. And what do you say, Geralt? The girl has taken after her mother. It's even a shame to waste her on that red-haired light crack. The only hope is that the pop might grow into someone with East Tursach's class. It's the same blood, after all. Are you listening, Geralt? Sintra has to form an alliance with Skalika, because the interest of the state demands it. My daughter has to marry the right person. Those are the results you must ensure me. I have to ensure that. Isn't your will alone sufficient for it to happen? Events might take such a turn that it won't be sufficient. What can be stronger than your will? Destiny. Aha. Uh -huh. So, I, a poor witcher, am to face down a destiny which is stronger than the royal will. A witcher fighting destiny. What irony. Yes, Geralt. What irony. Never mind. Your Majesty, it seems the service you demand borders on the impossible. If it bordered on the possible, Calanthe drawled, I would manage it myself. I wouldn't need the famous Geralt of Rivia. Stop being so clever. Everything can be dealt with. It's only a question of price. Bloody hell, there must be a figure on your witch's price list for work that borders on the impossible. I can guess one, and it isn't Lou. You ensure me my outcome, and I will give you what you ask. What did you say? I'll give you whatever you ask for, and I don't like being told to repeat myself. I wonder, Witcher, do you always try to dissuade your employers as strongly as you are me? Time is slipping away. Answer, yes or no? Yes. That's better. That's better, Geralt. Your answers are much closer to the ideal. They're becoming more like those I expect when I ask a question. So, discreetly, stretch your left hand out and feel behind my throne. Geralt slipped his hand under the yellow-blue drapery. Almost immediately, he felt a sword secured to the leather-upholstered backrest. A sword well known to him. Your Majesty, he said quietly. Not to repeat what I said earlier about killing people. You do realise that a sword alone will not defeat destiny. I do. Calanthe turned her head away. A witcher is also necessary. As you see, I took care of that. Your magic Not another word, Geralt. We've been conspiring for too long. They're looking at us, and East is getting angry. Talk to the Castellan. Have something to eat, drink, but not too much. I want you to have a steady hand. He obeyed. The Queen joined a conversation between Aist, Visegerd, and Mousesack, with Pavetta's silent and dreamy participation. Drogodar had put away his loot and was making up for his lost eating time. Haxo wasn't talkative. The Voivode with the hard-to-remember name, who must have heard something about the affairs and problems of Fourhorn, politely asked whether the mares were foaling well. Geralt answered yes, much better than the stallions. He wasn't sure if the joke had been well taken, but the voivode didn't ask him any more questions. Mouse Sack's eyes constantly sought the witches, but the crumbs on the table didn't move again. Krach and Crete was becoming more and more friendly with the two brothers from Strept. The third, the youngest brother, was paralytic, having tried to match the drinking speed imposed by Drig Bondu. The scald had emerged from it unscathed. The younger and less important lords gathered at the end of the table, tipsy, started singing a well-known song, out of tune, about a little goat with horns and a vengeful old woman with no sense of humour. A curly-haired servant and a captain of the guards wearing the gold and blue of Sintra ran up to Visegerd. The marshal, frowning, listened to their report, rose and leaned down from behind the throne to murmur something to the queen. Calanthe glanced at Geralt and answered with a single word. Visegerd leant over even further and whispered something more. The queen looked at him sharply and, without a word, slapped her armrest with an open palm. The marshal bowed 
and passed the command to the captain of the guards. Geralt didn't hear it, but he did notice that Moussac wriggled uneasily and glanced at Pavetta. The princess was sitting motionless, her head lowered. Heavy footsteps, each accompanied by the clang of metal striking the floor, could be heard over the hum at the table. Everyone raised their heads and turned. The approaching figure was clad in armour of iron sheets and leather treated with wax. His convex, angular, black and blue breastplate overlapped a segmented apron and short thigh pads. The armour-plated brassards bristled with sharp steel spikes, and the visor, with its densely grated screen extending out in the shape of a dog's muzzle, was covered with spikes like a conquer casing. Clattering and grinding, the strange guest approached the table and stood motionless in front of the throne. Noble Queen! Honourable gentlemen, said the newcomer, bowing stiffly. Please forgive me for disrupting your ceremonious feast. I am Erkion of Erlenwald. Greetings, Erkion of Erlenwald, said Calanthe slowly. Please take your place at the table. In Sintar we welcome every guest. Thank you, Your Majesty. Erkion of Erlenwald bowed once again, and touched his chest with a fist clad in an iron gauntlet. But I haven't come to Sintra as a guest, but on a matter of great importance and urgency. If your majesty permits, I will present my case immediately, without wasting your time. Archeon of Erlenwald, said the queen sharply, a praiseworthy concern about our time does not justify lack of respect. And such as you're speaking to us from behind an iron trellis. Remove your helmet, and we'll endure the time wasted while you do. My face, your majesty, must remain hidden for the time being, with your permission. An angry ripple, punctuated here and there with the odd curse, ran through the gathered crowd. Moussac, lowering his head, moved his lips silently. The witcher felt the spell electrify the air for a second, felt it stir his medallion. Calanthe was looking at Erkion, narrowing her eyes and drumming her fingers on her armrest. Granted, she said finally, I choose to believe your motive is sufficiently important. So, what brings you here, Archeon, without a face? Thank you, said the newcomer, but I'm unable to suffer the accusation of lacking respect, so I explain that it is a matter of a knight's vows. I am not allowed to reveal my face before midnight strikes. Calanthe, raising her hand perfunctorily, accepted his explanation. Erkion advanced, his spiked armour clanging. Fifteen years ago, he announced loudly, your husband, King Rogner, lost his way while hunting in Erlenwald. Wandering around the pathless tracts, he fell from his horse into a ravine and sprained his leg. He lay at the bottom of the gully and called for help, but the only answer he got was the hiss of vipers and the howling of approaching werewolves. He would have died without the help he received. I know what happened, the Queen affirmed. If you know it too, then I guess you are the one who helped him. Yes, it is only because of me he returned to you in one piece and well. I am grateful to you then, Archeon of Erlenwald. That gratitude is none the lesser for the fact that Rugner, gentleman of my heart and bed, has left this world. Tell me. If the implication that your aid was not disinterested does not offend another of your knightly vows, how I can express my gratitude? You well know my aid was not disinterested. You know, too, that I have come to collect the promised reward for saving the king's life. Oh, yes. Galante smiled, but green sparks lit up her eyes. So, you found a man at the bottom of a ravine, defenceless, wounded, at the mercy of vipers and monsters. And only when he promised you a reward did you help. And if he didn't want to or couldn't promise you something, you'd have left him there. And to this day I wouldn't know where his bones lay. How noble. No doubt your actions were guided by a particularly chivalrous vow at the time. The murmur around the hall grew louder. And today you come for your reward, Archeon, continued the Queen, smiling even more ominously. After fifteen years? No doubt you're counting the interest accrued over this period. This isn't the Dwarves' Bank, Archeon. 
You say Rokna promised you a reward. Ah, well, it will be difficult to get him to pay you. It would be simpler to send you to him, into the other world, to reach an agreement over who owes what. I loved my husband too dearly, Archeon, to forget that I could have lost him then, fifteen years ago, if he hadn't chosen to bargain with you. The thought of it arouses rather ill feeling towards you. Masked newcomer, do you know that here in Sitra, in my castle and in my power, you are just as helpless and close to death as Rogna was then, at the bottom of the ravine? What will you propose? What price? What reward will you offer? If I promise you will leave here alive. The medallion on Geralt's neck twitched. The witcher caught Mausak's clearly uneasy gaze. He shook his head a little and raised his eyebrows questioningly. The druid also shook his head and, with a barely perceptible move of his curly beard, indicated Urkion. Geralt wasn't sure. 